Well, greetings and welcome to Trinity Bible Church. This is our Wednesday evening Bible study. My name is Bill Gauss. And uh, if you're a first time visitor, we are so glad that you're with us and we hope that you'll join us again uh, in person when this pandemic uh, subsides and we're able to uh, meet again at our building on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. Again, that's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. And before we go to the Word of God, let's ask Him to bless our study together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in front of your, uh, your feet this, this evening as we study uh, what you've uh, given us through your Apostle Peter. We pray that you would help us to um, calm ourselves, to open up our hearts and minds to your Word so that we might apply it to our lives and be able to be better ministers to others because of it. Uh, help us to, as we'll learn tonight, help us to submit uh, to um, other people, to our um, employers, to our governments. Help us to do that so that you might be glorified. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless our study in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, and let's read that together. Beloved, as a, uh, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from lusty, uh, fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, or as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Uh, Peter begins this section by calling his readers beloved uh, or beloved. Um, while I really, while I really like the NIV's word choices most of the time, the NIV translates this word as friends, and I think it's a weak translation here because the idea goes way beyond the level of uh, simple human friendship. Uh, it involves a much deeper level of affection, and that affection comes from our relationship in Christ and to other believers who are also in Christ. I just don't think friends really gets to the deep love uh, that is understood by the Greek word that is used. Uh, in my opinion, beloved is much closer to the original meaning. Uh, at any rate, um, whether or not you agree with me on that point, uh, I've already mentioned two characteristics that are attached to his greeting, uh, beloved. Uh, first, this word beloved refers to the people's standing before God. Peter just got done showing us that Christ is the chief cornerstone and the living stone and that we have been made living stones in him through our rebirth. Uh, the New Testament says that Christ is the beloved and we are the beloved by extension. Uh, we are in Christ and participate in the inheritance that the Father gives to him. And we also participate in this special level of affection that the Father has for the Son. So in the first sense of the word, Peter is reminding us that we are God's beloved or beloved. Second, Peter uses this word to express his own personal affection for the people of God. It's, it's not used much today, um, but some of you may have sat under preachers at one point in time who have called their congregation beloved or beloved. My Uncle Ralph is one of these preachers. He uses the word regular, regularly uh, to address his own congregation in our sister church, uh, Trinity Bible Church in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a biblical term and a beautiful term as well. Uh, it's found all throughout Scripture. In the, books of Act, in the book of Acts, uh, we have a glimpse of some of the conflict in the early church that focused on how the Jewish Christians were supposed to be receiving and accepting Gentile believers. 
Uh, you might remember that this issue escalated to a serious confrontation between Peter and Paul, um, Peter being the apostle to the Jews and Paul being the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, the debate even resulted in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. Uh, P Paul called Peter out for his tendency to be weak at times and his tendency to capitulate to Judaizers. Uh, but when we read Peter's epistle, we find that there are many similarities uh, between how Paul and Peter lived the Christian life. Uh, one obvious reason for their similarities is that they were both inspired by the same Holy Spirit in writing Scripture, so that the differences that they may have had in the flesh disappeared altogether uh, when it came to writing Scripture. Uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Peter writes something very similar here in verse 11. He says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Uh, Peter used the term pilgrims in the very beginning of this epistle, you might remember, verse 1 of chapter 1. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Jews were supposed to practice hospitality. Uh, it was a God-given responsibility. Um, being hospitable was very, very important to the Jewish people because it was rooted in the fact that they had been pilgrims and sojourners who possessed no land. In fact, it's still very popular today in the Middle East among many uh, ethnic groups. Uh, since they had experienced the kindness and graciousness of other people, they were to show grace to others in the form of hospitality. Again, the same practice goes on to this day. Uh, remember, Peter is writing to the Jews who are pilgrims in Asia Minor, and he won't let them forget that they are sojourners on earth, uh, because their real citizenship, of course, is in heaven. Um, and by extension, of uh, uh, really, he's talking to us. Uh, Peter stresses this because we are to live our lives on earth as citizens of heaven. Uh, the behavior of fallen people should never become the standard of right and wrong for the Christian. A uh, big problem in our churches today is that even after people are converted to Christ, they continue to look to the world and live according to the, the world's expectations or uh, whatever modern uh, worldly culture says is, is, is acceptable today. Uh, and we have to remember that we don't belong to that culture. Um, as Paul says, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, we don't get a new mind by looking to the world. We get it by paying attention to the mind of Christ so that we begin to think like Jesus. No matter what everyone else does, if Jesus doesn't approve, then we can't do it. Uh, we need to remember who we are, citizens of heaven, and our lives are supposed to demonstrate that reality. Uh, some of you might have also caught on to the fact that verse 11 also calls Christians to be different from the world in terms of our sexual behavior. Um, that is also emphasized by Paul. Uh, but the fleshly lust that Peter is referring to includes a lot more than just sexual behavior. Um, fleshly lusts have to do with the desires of the sarks. You might remember that word uh, from our other studies. That is the Greek term that is translated flesh in English. Uh, so to abstain from fleshly lusts is basically to abstain from the desires of this world. Uh, our fleshly lusts give us a higher priority uh, to indulging them over our obedience. Paul describes it this way. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17. Uh, Peter says that these fleshly lusts, these desires, passions or ambitions, they war against the soul. And again, it's very easy for us in our flesh to indulge them, uh, but we are called to obey Christ. I get a bit annoyed uh, when I hear television preachers say, 
Come to Jesus and all your, proverb, uh, all your problems will be over. Um, life really doesn't get complicated until you are a Christian. Unbelievers do what they want. They go along with the group. They go along with the world. Uh, when someone becomes a Christian, however, the war between the flesh and the spirit comes alive in a brand new way that was never there before. Satan has literally declared war on the believer's souls. And we are engaged every day in a spiritual battle to maintain our integrity and obey Christ. What things war against your soul? Question, right? What things war against your soul? Where is the battle in your life? Is it with your ambition? Do you have to compromise your integrity to get what you want or, or achieve what you want uh, to achieve? Uh, there is a unique battle for every single believer. Uh, my struggles might be different from yours, and yours are probably different from mine. Everyone comes into the Christian life from a different background and with different scars, with different bents, which are deeply ingrained habits. Uh, we all have battles. So every now and again, we need to ask, what is stirring up that conflict in my soul? Answering that question or how you answer that question will give you a better idea of what you need to die to in order to be alive in Christ. Uh, Jesus taught us a simple principle when he asked, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Um, what He's measuring the benefits this world offers against the value of the soul. Uh, if we were to gain the whole world at the cost of your soul, would it be worth it? He also put it this way. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Movies have been made and books have been written, and we all know the theme. It, that someone has a great desire for something, and Satan, a Satan figure anyway, uh, gives that person their desires in exchange for their soul. Uh, I'm a musician, and Paganini, it was a, a story that got passed around that Niccolo Paganini sold his soul to the devil to be such a great violinist. Um, it's safe to say that if that is real, it never works out well for the person who sells his or her soul. Unless, of course, it's a Disney movie. Uh, Little Mermaid, anyone? You know? Uh, how much we do, uh, how much do we value our souls? Um, how much is our integrity worth? Uh, even if we're homeless, jobless, which many of, many of us might be right now under the conditions of this um, uh, pandemic that we're experiencing. Um, even if we have nothing in the bank, which is probably more uh, common than anything else right now, we still have our integrity. But how much is that worth? We have to deal with the question in, uh, we have to deal with that question in the wars that we have with the world every single day. Um, and by the way, if you don't know this, your integrity is priceless. At this point, Peter begs us to abstain from not just sexual temptation, but everything that wars against our souls. Uh, he says uh, something a little strange next, uh, but it's similar again to what Paul says. He, uh, Peter says in verse 12, Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Our conduct should be honorable all the time, so that when someone speaks evil against us, we won't respond in kind or lose control of our emotions because of what someone else says. It doesn't matter how other people behave. It matters how we behave, especially as Christians. We can't control what other people do, but we can control what we do and what, how we respond. Uh, and God certainly holds us accountable for our actions. Uh, throughout this passage, Peter uses some form or another of the word honor. Uh, just recently, I wrote an obituary for my grandfather uh, who died of the virus. Uh, and I refer to him in that obituary as an honorable man. Uh, in the courtroom, judges are still referred to as your honor. Uh, in a speech he gave several decades ago, General 
Douglas MacArthur said this, Duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, and what you will be. Uh, is it me, or has this word honor all but disappeared from our vocabulary today? Uh, it really belongs to a pastime. Um, but if you look up the word honor in a Bible concordance, you, you'd probably be surprised how often the word is used. Even in the Ten Commandments, for instance, honor your father and your mother. Honor goes way beyond respect. To honor is to bend over backwards to show respect for someone else. Our good works should provoke or push other people to give glory to God in spite of how they might feel about us or you or me, right, us, or, for, or how they feel about God or their lack of love for God. Uh, have you ever encountered a missionary, pastor, or ministry that is devoted to helping people that are almost like society deems them unhelpable or, or beyond help, uh, uh, like too ugly in certain ways to help? Uh, prostitutes, drug addicts, alcoholics, criminals, prisoners, the list goes on and on. Uh, these are people who don't even want to stop in many cases. These are people who don't want to stop the sin that enslaves them. But if you were to ask them about how they felt about the ministers or the ministries that help them, that reach out to them, they would have nothing but reverence and respect for them. That reverence is an expression of the glory of God who will be glorified in what Peter calls the day of visitation. This is another way of saying the day of the Lord, which is used many times in the Old Testament. It, it referred to the day when God would come. Uh, the prophets and the, the faithful Jews looked forward to the day of God's coming, the day of his visitation. Uh, but when the sin in Israel became so bad that Amos said to the people, uh, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Amos chapter 5 verse 18. Uh, it's interesting that in the New Testament the word visit is formed from the root of the word bishop. Very interesting. Uh, the concept then of bishop in the New Testament is that of visitor. Okay. It comes from the Greek military. Every now and then, the general would stop in unannounced to review the troops. The troops were praised if the general found that they were ready to go to war. But if they weren't ready, of course, they'd be reprimanded. Uh, that same metaphor is used to describe the day of, vi of visitation when our heavenly bishop comes. Uh, and we should always be prepared for that day. In Luke chapter 18, the parable of the persistent widow begins with this line. He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Uh, in the parable, Jesus tells the story of a poor woman who was treated unjustly. She goes to a judge to have her case heard, but the judge doesn't care about her. Uh, he ignores her over and over again until she finally wears him down through sheer persistence. Uh, to stop her nagging, the judge hears her case and ultimately vindicates her. Jesus then said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Believers should be thankful. Believers should find comfort in the fact that Jesus, the heavenly bishop of our soul, keeps us prepared for that day of visitation through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we come to Peter's conclusion, verse 13. And I'm going to end here tonight. Uh, we'll probably study the rest of these verses here next week. But verse 13, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Peter transitions into a large section about submission to kings, governors, um, civil authorities, 
and the way that we're supposed to interact with those entities. Um, we're to submit to those whom God has placed over us, alongside us, and under us. We are to be known as submissive people, humble people, if you will. Um, and we'll come back to that section as a whole, of course, but here we'll focus on Peter's uh, introductory comment, therefore submit yourselves. First, we shouldn't wait to be forced into submission by God or anyone else. We are to willingly submit ourselves to every ordinance of man. In my neighborhood, there's multiple speed limit signs down the street, and there are also stop signs on every corner. Somebody spent a lot of money for nothing because tons of people don't give a hint of slowing down and then they don't come to a complete stop. They don't submit to the ordinance. Is it, tr it is true that Peter says that we are to submit to every ordinance of man, that th but that has to be qualified. We are to submit unless those ordinances limit us from doing what God commands. We also shouldn't submit if we are commanded to do something that God forbids. If that's the way it is, then we shouldn't be submissive and we shouldn't give in either. Peter is telling us to be submissive in a general way. It's important to understand why Peter comes to this conclusion. He tells us to submit to authorities for the Lord's sake, not for your sake, not for my sake, but for the Lord's sake. And to understand this, we have to see the scope of the biblical concept of obedience, submission, and authority. Our universe is not a democracy, contrary to what many believe. God doesn't rule by vote. Have you ever heard the expression that the Ten Commandments are not ten suggestions? There is a hierarchy, there's a structure of authority in the universe, and at the top of that structure is our sovereign God, who reigns and rules supreme. He has delegated all authority in heaven and earth to his son, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. So at the top of this hierarchy is Christ, right? Nero was king when this epistle was written. He was still under the authority of Jesus, but he wouldn't submit because he had a spirit of lawlessness. And that same spirit works in all the sons of disobedience, all of the unsaved, in other words. And Satan is synonymous with, Satan's name anyway, it's synonymous with lawlessness. The, the, the creature Satan is synonymous with lawlessness. The fall of the human race happened because of our original parents' act of lawlessness. In other words, Adam and Eve refused to submit to the Creator. Therefore, every time we fail to submit to the rules, we're standing on the side of lawlessness. And every time we go out of our way to submit, we then give honor to the one whose law stands above every other law. Every time we obey our employer, our school teacher, our parents, whatever, we give honor to Christ who reigns over the whole universe. This is where the word honor comes into play. Before God saved us, we walked according to the course of this world. We walked according to the power of the prince of the air, according to the lust of our flesh, just like the rest of the world. While we were in that state, the Holy Spirit made us alive. He made us new creatures and called us out of the land of darkness and into the land of light. He gave us a new inclination. He gave us a desire to please God rather than to disobey him. So, when we submit, we are showing our commitment to our King, Jesus Christ. Well, we hope you've been blessed and edified by this lesson. Again, um, it's a pleasure to have all of you with us. Uh, and we hope if you're visiting that you'll join us uh, as a congregation on Lincoln Avenue when, we, uh, when we're done this uh, lockdown. Um, the Lord's in control, though, everyone. Uh, and I pray that uh, you will look to him for guidance and uh, peace through all of this uh, crazy times here that we're going through. Uh, Heavenly Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us the ability and the means to study it. I pray that we would do just that, to use this time of uh, separation and lockdown to really 
have some one-on-one -on -one time with you, Lord, to repent of things that we have allowed to accumulate in our lives and keep us away from a right relationship with you. Lord, we love you so much, and our desire is to be more like Christ. So please sanctify us, continue to sanctify us uh, at, at whatever cost, Lord. Uh, thank you for all that you do for us, the safety that you've given us thus far, and we pray that that continues. Pray for our, we pray for our, uh, our leaders, our government officials, first responders, uh, and, and uh, health care workers. Lord, uh, continue to give them the minds that they need to um, navigate uh, this pandemic and uh, to make the decisions that are best um, for everyone and help us, Lord, to submit to those decisions. Uh, and Lord, more, most importantly, I pray that you would keep uh, unbeliever uh, officials, those officials who rule over us that don't know you, we pray that you would keep them from making laws or executive orders that would conflict with uh, the um, regulations that you have set aside for your children. Uh, Lord, in that case, I pray that you would give us the, the gumption to disobey civilly and to submit, of course, to you in all things. Lord, thank you again. We pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, and we will see you on Sunday morning at 9.30 on our YouTube channel. God bless you.